lunch. It's me, Hugh. It's Thursday, and this is the Medical Spotlight part of the show. Uh, our next guest is one of Toronto's top plastic surgeons. Uh, been doing it for uh, over 20 years and has advanced the art of facial plastic. And uh, we're very happy to have Dr. Phil Solomon joining us. And Phil, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Can I call you Phil or should I talk? say doctor? Phil's either one, Dr. Phil or Phil's <laughs> fine. Okay, I'm not going to say Dr. Phil. No, I'm not going to use them together like that. But uh, anyway, uh, thanks for coming down. Great to have you here. Um, so let's, uh, you know, I want to start with uh, what made, you know, what, how did you become a plastic surgeon? I mean, when did you make the decision to start heading in that direction? Right. So my specialty is uh, head and neck surgery, and I subspecialize in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery, which means I only operate on the face and neck, and it clavicles up. And um, like most people who go into medicine, they don't really know necessarily exactly what they want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, you know, their personalities and their interests sort of uh, evolve, I guess, um, as they go through the program of training to be a doctor and then continue to evolve throughout their career. Uh, so I trained at the University of Toronto just around the corner from here and uh, I was influenced by a mentor who was a head and neck cancer surgeon, but he also did reconstructive facial surgery as part of his practice. And uh, that led me into that field. And then during that training program, which is a five year surgical training program after medical school, uh, I was exposed to a number of surgeons who um, real experts, I'd say international experts in facial plastic surgery and uh, was influenced by them as well. So when I started my career, I was doing head and neck surgery, um, mm. primarily endocrine surgery, skin cancer surgery um, and things like that on the face. So it wasn't neck. really like cosmetic plastic surgery, it was it, real. Well, I always did both. I always did a combination. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of my practice was aesthetic surgery. And I always had an interest in both. So any procedures on the face and neck, whether it be aesthetic or reconstructive in nature were things that I was doing. And then we were, I was also doing tumor surgery one day a week. Um, and then as I went through my career, I've sort of developed a, a real passion for um, rhinoplasty, which is nose job surgery, which really you can spend your whole career developing and um, cultivating an expertise. It's almost like a, uh, an operation onto its own. And um, as that part of my practice became busier and busier, I've sort of started to refocus my energies primarily on the aesthetic side of my practice. So currently the practice involves uh, rhinoplasty, revision rhinoplasty, which is, you know, nose jobs that go bad or botched like the TV show, um, facelifts, eye lifts, facial implants, um, grafting fat to people's faces as they get older, they often get real lean and things like that. So those are the things that I'm focusing primarily on at this stage of my career. So you mentioned a passion for uh, rhinoplasty, for nose. That's right. I mean, what was it that got you to be passionate about Passionate it? about it? Yeah, it's sort of a bizarre thing to be passionate about. But it's, um, it's a very unusual operation in that every case is different to some extent. It's an um, operation that requires a lot of attention to detail, and it can have dramatic like really dramatic effects on someone's overall appearance because it's the center point of the face. And so you can really alter someone's appearance dramatically. And you're doing something that the results are, you, you see them immediately. So, I mean, it's a process rhinoplasty, but you're, the surgical approach mm -hmm. and the procedure is done and the results are almost, you'll see changes immediately, which is really satisfying if that's your, you know, your personality. Mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, I did a thing called personalysis and it assesses your personality. I was involved with the medical administration at my hospital. I was chief of surgery for uh, almost a decade. And uh, personalis is something that's used throughout medicine, but also I think in uh, industry as well for CEOs and presidents and people like that have mm -hmm. to do these tests. And it divides your personality into different colors and uh, based on the way you view problems and solutions. And uh, red is that you're really like driven to if I recall correctly, you know, you have a problem and you want to fix it right away. And, you know, green was like, maybe you want to work collaboratively with others. To I think I did resolve that thing once. Did you do it once? Yeah, I think it was a green blue. Yeah, you strike me as a green blue <laughs> kind of guy. And, uh, 
you know, so when mine got done and, you know, it was just, I always think of this, it, it was all like almost all red. And I think probably most surgeons are all red in that they want to sort of see a problem and fix it. And so plastic surgery and many surgical disciplines allow you to see a problem and then you have sort of a, you want to fix it quickly. And then with nose jobs, you're, you're taking a problem, which maybe someone's been haunted by their appearance of their nose. It's affected their overall self-confidence and their psychology or the way they perceive themselves. And it's like, really, you can make a massive change in their appearance and then have all these other secondary benefits, hopefully, if things go well, uh, really quickly. So, you know, I think that's what drew me to that operation. And then the operation itself on a pure technical perspective has changed a lot. So it's always sort of evolving. So you're always, it's a sort of lifelong learning kind of project. Like we use uh, techniques now that were sort of just evolving when I started 20 years ago that are now commonplace, like taking out a piece of someone's rib to reconstruct the nose. That was sort of like done in very rare cases. When I started now, we do it almost routinely for re reconstructive procedures that have gone awry or botched. You know, so do you see a, an evolution? In, in other words, things are getting better. You've got more tools at your disposal that allow you to do a better job more often. I think so. And I think those jobs in general, like you look back in old TV shows like Dynasty or Dallas and things that were big when we were kids. And uh, and you look at the what we viewed as attractive or beautiful. You can often look at it now and still see the beauty in some of these actresses back then. But you can tell who had a nose job. Now the general aesthetic perspective has also evolved so you have these different moving parts technical things changing tools changing psychology changing pop culture social media yeah, everything changing fashion so, changes right? That's right so you, you gotta get a, a new i gotta get the new style nose well now we're no. trying to do uh what we call not really stylized noses we want sort of like noses that are classic that'll like be beautiful forever Right. And we don't want them to look. So what I mean by that is we don't want to have someone look like that in those job. Or that's oh, you've got a 70s bad. nose. You don't that's want right. that. We don't want a 70s, happen, 80s right? nose. We don't want the, the classic was a bit of a overly pinched nose. It was overly scooped out. Oh, yeah. And um, and mm -hmm. I think that that was, you know, attractive for many reasons. Nose jobs, you know, we could talk for an hour about nose jobs. Nose jobs uh, date back to, you know, the turn of this uh, before the turn of the century. But modern nose jobs, you know, and uh Germany were being uh, performed by a surgeon Jack Joseph, who was actually um, uh, culturally sensitive to different people's ethnicities and was uh, changing people's appearances probably due to racism and things mm -hmm. and anti-Semitism and all sorts of things. And some of those early techniques evolved. And um, there's a lot of interesting history behind the rhinoplasty from a societal perspective to feel like you wanted to belong or fit in. Mm -hmm. And then there's... Um, you know, then there's, you know, Freud and people like that uh, from a psychoanalytical perspective have some research into nose jobs and Actually, noses I, as well. So I heard I heard something that if you have a big nose, it means uh, there's a, a strong correlation with big noses to financial success. Prosperity. Yeah. I mean, there could be there could be something yeah. like that. That may be some medieval sort of racial thing as well. But who knows? Um but uh, there's also, you know, from a attraction point of view and um, how people self-identify themselves, female, masculine, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you, so I'm just curious, like when you're walking down the street with with this background, like can you look at it almost anybody and say, oh, I would like to, you know, you look at everybody's nose and say that nose sh should be a little bit more like that or that person has a perfect nose i don't even want to touch that or you know like yeah yeah, yeah. no that... i think probably on some level i probably do um yeah. i think that uh certainly we can identify people with abnormal noses um i can also appreciate attractive noses that may not fall within the parameters of what we consider ideal sometimes i'll see a patient who i think is extremely attractive and they may have a dominant large nose and i almost have like uh, my own personal conflict as to whether the aesthetic operation is indicated or not. Well, that's, that's what I w wanted to get into a little bit because, um, I mean, you kind of mentioned before we came on about how, you know, how I don't have difficult clients and, 
you know, kind of alluding to the fact that maybe you do have some difficult clients you have to deal with. And I'm, and I'm wondering about that case where someone comes in and uh, you're looking at them and you say, you know, you don't, you don't need anything. And yet they're asking you to do some kind of procedure. And I'm, I mean, how do you even, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would call it uh, challenging patients and uh, plastic surgery in general. I think you're going to be dealing with uh, lots of challenges because there is a psychological component and, uh, it's, you know, it's well known. And, um, you know, we're trying to sort of weed through patients while they're weeding through surgeons and trying to pick the surgeon to do their procedure. Mm -hmm. You're trying to weed through patients to make sure not only do they meet uh, physical criteria, and whether you can actually surgically offer them a procedure in a safe manner, but also whether they meet uh, psychological criteria that they seem stable enough. And it's not always apparent. And, you know, some people will ask me, well, you know, if someone's got depression or anxiety uh, or bipolar, uh, you wouldn't operate on them. And I'm like, no, you know, the interesting thing is that some people have diagnoses of uh, what we call DSM classification of psychological um, disorders, or conditions or diseases, and uh, some of those patients can sail through and have no problem whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Whereas you can have someone who's uh, psychologically described as intact and has no uh, pre-existing uh, notion of um, um, any ty type of psych psychiatric illness, and you can do a nose job on them and things may go smoothly or maybe not perfectly smoothly and they go off potentially off the rails and, you know, anxiety can evolve throughout the entire process. So the ones that are most challenging are people who have what's called body dysmorphia. Um, and there's probably different degrees of it, meaning that the way they see themselves may not be exactly the way I see them or you see them. And well, that's what, you know, people with anorexia have. That's that, right. 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 And we see that all the time and there's probably a whole spectrum of it. So sometimes we'll do a uh, nose on someone that we think the if I were to show the results to a panel of uh, expert surgeons, they may say it's an excellent result and the patient may be completely dissatisfied and unhappy with it. Whereas I can have an opposite scenario where someone, um, I may feel that maybe I can do more for them or I'm not 100% satisfied with the result and they're ecstatic and would never want to touch it again. So there's not a direct correlation between the outcome, physical outcome and the psychological happiness or the satisfaction of the patient because mm -hmm. there's all these other competing variables going on. And we sometimes see patients who struggle through the process and then I see them a year later and they're like, you know, thank you for being there for me. I was very difficult. I appreciate that you were patient with me and that you were understanding. And now when I look back, I was very difficult, but I love my result now. And it's a, a year after the original um, healing process. Mm -hmm. So you know, we do get stuff like that. And so, you know, we have to be sort of um, resilient. I, I think people in my field have to be somewhat resilient because um, you want to stay energized and you have to be empathetic and understanding that people who are embarking on this may have other things that may make it a bit of a uh, turbulent uh, process for them. It's not always perfectly smooth. The majority, it's pretty smooth. If it was the majority that wasn't smooth, it would be like a very extraordinarily challenging job. The majority mm -hmm. and the most satisfying of the patients that we do what we planned and they're ecstatic and they are so thankful and happy. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that are, you know, make our day and they come home all happy from mm -hmm. work. And mm -hmm. then there's pretty much in a busy practice like mine, there's always going to be some challenging cases. And the challenging cases aren't necessarily technically challenged. They can be emotionally challenged or demanding people who may want to do stuff that's just beyond my capability or anyone's capability they may think that i'm holding back on them that or I'm maybe not. you just don't you don't think that you really don't want to do it because you don't think it should be done that's right they may not want to hear what you have to say that's right they may not have acceptance of what you're saying because you see i mean you know michael jackson right right i mean i i'm not sure what happened there but uh i suspect that this is the kind of thing that people could actually get addicted to like uh, there, there's all sorts of different stuff to explain the michael jackson phenomenon he's the one that we use as an example because it's so blatant but there's degrees of it mm -hmm. but michael jackson was a celebrity and he had all the money in the world to spend on his rhinoplasty procedures and he went to presumably competent uh, and experienced rhinoplasty experts and despite that he ended up with a poor outcome if you follow his trend of the multiple procedures that he had, the initial few procedures he had, he actually had relatively nice outcome. Yeah. 
and then he crossed the line where he started going. So sometimes the you know that the line the enemy of good, of good is perfection, and when you're striving for perfection, you can create all sorts of problems. And um, Michael Jackson had the means to sort of push that boundary, mm-hmm. and then it comes back to the physician sort of being the safeguard. You know, you want to. As hard as it may be for us to say no, mm-hmm. sometimes the right thing to say is no. And, and, and we're human too. We may go in with the best intentions. You know, maybe I can make it slightly better. It doesn't always have to be financial motivation. You may think like, or it could be your own ego. Of, I think I can do more for Michael Jackson than his well, previous surgeon. Because some of these patients move around surgeon to surgeon. Well, who knows? Maybe he had a surgeon that said, no, you've... That's right. Any more is too much, and Mike, and maybe he just went to see someone else. Right, and yeah. then that surgeon may have had great intentions as well, and uh, ultimately uh, didn't say no, and problems arise, and and we see degrees of that all the time. Mm. Um, and what I mean, what would an example of the worst patient be? I mean, what would it be more of a technical issue or more of a I mean, and how do you even deal with it? Because I could see that ruining somebody's whole day. I yeah. mean, is there an example that you can give us? You know, it's tough because we have. So I, I could cite you examples that would be. Um, they're they're often complicated scenarios. You know, we can have a patient who has a simple procedure such as a facial injectable filler, mm-hmm. and the patient. Um, can go online and uh, convince themselves that they had some kind of catastrophic event because they have a little bruise, um, and they and their anxiety can be triggered from something minor like that, and they can then be, uh, become almost disturbed from it, and um, they can invest an enormous amount of energy in trying to almost prove to themselves or to me that something I'm uh, almost catastrophizing the situation. And I find those extremely tough cases because you're trying to maintain confidence and trust to manage your patient. It mm-hmm. is a medical patient. Mm-hmm. And even though they've undergone something that's somewhat minor, uh, trivial treatment, we would consider compared to the big surgeries we do. And um, they can, they can uh, use up a ton of your resources time-wise and um, your own emotional resources, you know, because you're, you know, you're trying your hardest to, to deal with a very difficult uh, person potentially. So mm-hmm. that happens, I'd say, I've seen that scenario maybe a few times in my practice over 20 years, and they are certainly ones that, um, unfortunately, I remember them. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the technical issues we have with uh, mm-hmm. surgical patients we're able to resolve. You know, I tell patients up front that there's a certain percentage secondary surgery or touch-up rate required, and we usually quote roughly 10%, which is not negligible. You know, it's a significant number, and usually it's for minor imperfections if we feel that we can improve upon it. Um, but that leaves a little bit of latitude for where where it's worth pursuing or not. Um, the chance of having a catastrophic or terrible outcome is less than one percent in procedures that we do on a regular basis. I was going to ask you about that because you know, I mean, I, I would just be so devastating to have a catastrophic outcome, and 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 is it possible to have a catastrophic outcome that can't be fixed? Yeah, I mean, I, fortunately, I've never had anything like that in my practice. So usually, if we have a, a bad outcome, we're almost always able to to do something to improve it. I had one patient many years ago get a very unusual infection on their nose after a rhinoplasty, and the rhinoplasty initially looked great, mm-hmm. and then the patient developed a strange infection necessitating hospitalization, and then the cartilage on the bridge of her nose from the infection actually was eaten away so the skin was fine but the nose sank down we call it a saddle nose deformity and um you know she had an ordinary procedure there was nothing unusual done but developed this and uh, she was a real trooper and ultimately we were able to rectify it she required two more procedures and ultimately we took a piece of cartilage from under her breast and we built back up her nose so this is someone who came in for a standard cosmetic nose job with a big nose uh, we did a standard rhinoplasty to make it uh, more appropriately balanced to her other facial features. Infection dissolved away some of the cartilage, and we had to start rebuilding the nose. So that's rare, but that kind of thing can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but we we're able to rectify it. 
ca a true catastrophic outcome would have, I've never had this, but you know, when we're operating on facelifts, you technically could cut the facial nerve, which is a nerve that moves your face. And I have seen patients in my practice who've had surgery by other surgeons, and I have seen patients with um, weakness of the facial movement on one side. Not total weakness, but certain mm -hmm. branches of facial nerve that have been injured. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we, we quote that at roughly 1% or less of that occurring. It's a known risk of the procedure. Um, but I would consider that, a, you know, obviously, and, that, and sometimes that's fixable and sometimes it's not fixable. You know, so that'd be considered a very severe complication of a purely elective operation. But the thing is the patient are educated, mm -hmm. they're informed and they go through a, they're meant to go through a detailed consent process outlining this. And uh, the surgeon's taking risk operating on you, but ultimately the patient's um, accepting the risk because they they're the one- They have full responsibility. Full responsibility. Right? Patients yeah. don't sometimes want to, but a patient has made a, elective decision to seek out a surgeon unless surgeon does something negligent which is extremely uh, unlikely you know in the in, in a place like canada where we're highly regulated highly trained i mean no one's looking to do things that are negligent but com a complication is not negligence complication is a complication negligence would be doing something very unusual or below what's called the standard of care and i'm just curious like is this uh is this all covered by uh ohip or the uh or socialized medicine or no no so aesthetic surgery is something that's considered outside of the healthcare system it's private medicine and patients pay for it in some circumstances patients can have a partial coverage if they have for instance with nose jobs if they have a breathing problem right. a fractured nose uh, sinus infections where they're undergoing a medical procedure to correct those things yeah. and elect out the cosmetic component at the same time, there may be some slight uh, cost savings to them where the ministry's paying a small percentage of the procedure cost. Um, yeah, you know, and, and in some circumstances, complications of aesthetic surgery may be an insured benefit of OHIP. Um, if someone, for instance, had a terrible infection or a bleed, we would hospitalize them, and those those would uh, those kind of complications may be managed under the healthcare because they're medical related at that point. So uh, <clears throat> it just seems that uh, really uh, we're seem to be entering a period where, uh, for example, things like gender are is almost a choice now, right? And and in fact, uh, the way that you look can be a choice you know we're no longer just uh, stuck with uh, with what we were given and we can start to make some changes i understand that um you you do you can do facial feminization for example for somebody that's right. transitioning from male to female do you want right. to talk about that a little bit yeah sure i mean that's a big part of my practice facial feminization surgery and is, can you do uh, the opposite as well uh, I don't. Uh, my practice is primarily uh, male patients who have elected okay. to transition to female and um, they're looking to feminize their facial features. Uh, in the reverse, where a, a patient born female mm -hmm. is looking to transition to a male, often a lot of the changes that they're seeking are, are achieved with hormone replacement and testosterone. So far less of those patients are seeking out aesthetic uh, procedures that I'm performing. Uh, so the common stuff that I would perform would be, um, I'll start at the top down on the face and neck. So we perform a lot of what's called hairline lowering procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these patients have a male pattern re recession of their uh, hair. They can undergo conventional uh, hair transplant procedures. Um, but a procedure that we do a lot of is called the hairline lowering, where we're actually moving the entire scalp forward, and mm -hmm. that has a feminizing effect. Mm -hmm. That's often done in conjunction with smoothing over the forehead or lifting the brows, which can elevate the brows. A female's brows usually sit a little bit higher than a male's brow mm -hmm. and may have a little bit of an arch to the mm -hmm. eyebrow. Mm -hmm. And so we try to achieve that with surgery at the same time. And then lastly, we would smooth over the brow. A lot of uh, male patients, I mean, different degrees will have... Uh, Bossa or, or fullness in their super brow region, and we actually take that down, re reducing the uh, the prominence of the forehead bone with a um, surgical drill. Um, and so that's the upper third of the face, and then we get into uh, rhinoplasty, which we talked about before. Rhinoplasty, we can feminize the nose by giving it a slope, mm -hmm. making the tip more refined, and making the nose overall a little bit smaller. And so uh, a lot of patients undergoing 
facial feminization surgery or having that procedure done. Uh, facial fullness and shape, creating a heart-shaped face, uh, can either be achieved with filler, fat grafting, or facial implants. We, you know, I do all of those different procedures. And um, lips can be accentuated with filler or fat. Um, We've seen some horrible yeah, lip, lip. things gone wrong with the lips. Yeah, well, the classic ones, of, of the fish lip. Yeah. Call it. yeah. But I'll just finish because just two more things to mention. So jawline reshaping, we sometimes narrow the jaw. And then the um, Adam's apple, we often reduce. And that's sort of the common uh, sort of range of procedures that patients undergo for facial feminization. And then with regards to lip augmentation, um, you know, the goal is to keep a natural lip. Um, sometimes uh, lips can get over enhanced and look uh, artificial for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, what about, uh, I, I've seen some examples where people are uh, not just uh, changing, say, from male to female, but they want to start doing like some really crazy enhancements. Like I've seen things where they, they want to have horns put in or... <laughs> Or uh, they've got ball bearings. Uh, they want to look like monsters or something. I right. mean, have you ever had that, or something even? Yeah, I mean, that? I haven't really been approached to do any of those procedures at all. Yeah. Um, some of those are done almost like outside of the conventional plastic surgery realm. They mm -hmm. could be offered in uh, tattoo parlors and places like that. Some some of the procedures are surgical. Um, the thing that I'll see a fair bit of is, you know, ear lobe reshaping because some people have put in these big, big um, gouging uh, ear holes and mm -hmm. um, it stretches it out in an irreversible manner. And so we often have to reduce them. And uh, so that's a common procedure that we perform is uh, attempting to reconstruct and reshape the ear lobe. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, some of those other things are, are, are sort of unusual and um, they're not something that I would do. So... What would you say, I mean, you know, you, uh, of course, every, every doctor is different, but what would you say is the unique uh, talent that you bring to your practice that, that you're able to bring to your patients? Well, I think every person in my field is bringing a unique perspective, just like every person's unique. So mm -hmm. the perspective is a, an accumulation of what you've seen, where you've been and and what you've done and your training so you know there's a training component and then there your life experiences and the procedures that you the thousands of procedures that i've done up over the last you know that i've done over 20 years certainly mm -hmm. influences the way that i would manage things i do think that plastic surgery is a little bit like a, a professional athlete i do think that there's a, a period you peak at and then it probably um the, hopefully that peak can stay good for a while and there's a point where it starts to taper off because it is a physical job. Mm. And so, you know, when you're young and starting, the, you don't have the experience. You may be physically great and have great hand-eye coordination, but you don't have the experience. Mm -hmm. And then when you're about 10 years out, you start having experience and you still have the physical attributes. So that's when your peak starts. Mm -hmm. And then your peak sort of stays up until you start getting tired physically or start losing some of your dexterity or your vision. Or you might even get really, uh, you could, I could see because you're dealing with the patients and some yeah, of them are tired difficult. And you out. just get, yeah. Yeah. Although I have some colleagues who are working into their mid uh, late seventies and some of them are still quite capable. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, that's just my perspective on in terms of like the peak for most people's career is sort of like forties to probably sixties. My best skill. Yeah. So what would your, best skill be do you think you know what what is it i don't think it's why i don't think thing? you can put it on one thing yeah. i think i'm uh i think i'm a technically good surgeon i think i have a lot of experience i think i'm a very uh, open-minded and reasonable person and and um and i i do I get a lot of joy from helping people so mm -hmm. i think that uh all those things are hopefully what makes me unique and special and able to provide um bring my talent to the patients. Well, I get the sense too that uh, if a patient came to you and they really, and they wanted to do something and you really thought that wasn't in their best interest that you would let them know that or yeah, do your I best to really bring them through the process, uh, you know, in a way that's going to be ultimately as good as possible for them. 
Yeah, listen, I, I've been fortunate in that I've been very busy in my practice. And I think living in Toronto, all of us are fortunate. And I think that the economy has been good. And uh, I think a lot of people have sought out private procedures like this. And my practice has gotten very busy. And so I'm able to sort of be straight with patients if I don't think that they have uh, are great candidates. Mm -hmm. I think I'm candid. I think I'm honest. And I, I think I'm ethical. I think if you ask most people if they're ethical, most people will tell you they're ethical. But I think um, it goes beyond just regular ethics. You have to sort of be insightful and uh, true to yourself and hopefully true to the patient as to what you can provide and whether you think that they're going to benefit from the procedure you're offering. And it can be tricky. You don't always know. Okay, uh, so I'm uh, being prompted to ask, um, uh, are you, would you consider yourself a sex symbol, a plastic surgeon sex symbol? <laughs> I, 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 I've never, I've never thought of myself that way. I, yeah. I, I'm not sure where that question's coming I'm from, not, but I guess I, from I'll try there. to be flat. I'll try to take it as flattery from your audience though. It's very nice. Oh, okay. Um, no, are you still teaching at U of T? Yeah, I'm one of the um, facial plastic surgeons in the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, which is like a long name. But um, there's a core group of us that teach our residents um, how to um, practice facial plastic surgery. It's part of the otolaryngology program. They, in their fourth year of residency surgical training, uh, they'll spend some time with me or one of my colleagues. And uh, I'm... Uh, what would you, I mean, do you have any advice for new surgeons or new doctors or new plastic surgeons? I have lots of advice. I mean, it's, uh, you know, whatever, you know, when you look back on your career and you're trying to give advice to any person going into any career or medicine in particular, it's a huge commitment, mm -hmm. huge sacrifice. And you're um, really channeling, you're channeling all your energy into one thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you're developing a real skill for a very finite thing mm -hmm. compared to going into, say, business or becoming an entrepreneur where your skill set may be broader and you can apply to more things. So um, you have to really like it and you have to like it for the right reasons and you, you're going to be spending a long time doing it and um, it can be challenging. So you have to, at the early days, you're, you know, at the young stage in your life, it's, it's really hard because you don't really know what you're going to like. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I think it's, it's really challenging for people to pick the perfect job for themselves down the road. You're sort of guessing. Um, but I think if you commit to it and you've made the decision to go through with medicine as a career, you have to be resilient. You have to be um, hardworking. You have to be dedicated. You have to be compassionate. You have to be um, self-critical. You have to be lifelong learning. I mean, that's the things that make medicine great. It has mm -hmm. all those. Mm -hmm. But um, medicine's got a significant amount of physician burnout. Doctors can mm -hmm. burn out early, especially in Canada. You're working really hard. And mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly no easy ticket. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's a bit glamorized in certain avenues of the media. And I think it was different probably 30, 40 years ago being a doctor mm -hmm. um, in Canada and in the United States. So I think you have to really, you know, um, be committed to the notion of doing it. And if you do it, you can find lots of things in medicine that are super satisfying mm -hmm. and amazing, but it's uh, certainly a challenging, a challenging career. Well, it's been great to have you down here today and um, great to have this conversation. Good to uh, kind of learn some of the ins and outs about, uh, about plastic surgery. Um, if somebody is watching this and they want to maybe get in touch or, Go have a visit, go, go to your practice. What's the best way for them to do that? We're online. We have an online presence with our website, solomonfacialplastic.com, and it has all our contact information there. And um, we try our best to stay active on social media, on our Instagram account with the same name, Solomon Facial Plastic. And so we receive questions and do our best to get back to people on a daily basis. Okay, Thanks great. very much. Yeah, it's been, been good. Thanks for coming. It was great. Okay, cool. Well, that's it for uh, this one uh, here on Liquid Lunch. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you next time here on ThatChannel.com.